it is my pleasure right now uh, to introduce Dr. Kristen Steenerson. She's a neuro neurology trained otoneurologist at Stanford, highly specialized, um, and she specializes in vestibular disorders. She has cared for patients from Mayo, Arizona to Sydney, Australia, and in a wide array of disorders that cause specifically dizziness. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Steenerson to the podium. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming and uh, attending our second half of our vestibular sandwich after Aaron Eisenhart. So we're gonna talk about one of my favorite topics, which is dizziness. Giving you some context, sports concussion dizziness has some important key factors that differentiate it from other types of post-traumatic dizziness. So we know that many athletes experience dizziness ranging from 40 to 80%. The self-reported symptoms do have objective correlation, so there's a reason to really look into these. You're gonna get some data behind it. We know that on-field dizziness can be a risk factor for prolonged recovery following concussion, so it's something that we really want to key into early on in our evaluation. And we also know that because of the intricacies of sports and athletes, that having these types of dizziness difficulties can actually increase your risk later on. So giving that context, let's jump into dizziness. Now most people hear dizziness and they kind of groan. We all think, oh my gosh, this is too much. There are way too many things that are contributing to a sense of balance, to a sense of motion, sense of not feeling right, dissociation. There's no way I can pin this down. Well, I'm hoping today that we can give a, a little bit more context into how we can identify these discrete etiologies without feeling too bogged down by all these words. So where do these words come from? In the 1970s, a paradigm was created in terms of evaluating dizziness. So some key words came out that probably all of you use, such as lightheadedness versus vertigo versus dizziness versus a sense of dissociation. All of these were supposed to correspond with different organ systems. So cardiac syncope versus a neurologic sequelae versus a vestibular issue versus a psychogenic cause of these dizziness um, feelings. But a nice study out of Hopkins was done in uh, just the last five years that went to the emergency department for all comers looking in uh, who had chief complaint of dizziness. 62% of those patients selected multiple descriptors, so crossing all those categories that are supposed to differentiate them. And then 52% of those changed their description within six minutes of being asked again. All right, so the words are going to be troubling, and we have lots of reasons to really understand that because it's such a difficult feeling for people to describe. So instead, I'm going to try and help us understand some more discrete etiologies. So we're going to touch a little bit more on what Aaron talked about in terms of the function and dysfunction of peripheral and central vestibular systems, create a broader differential diagnosis beyond just post-concussive dizziness, um, talk about those common disorders, evaluation management, and then hopefully give you a cleaner approach to the post-concussive dizzy patient. So beautiful anatomy that we have in the inner ear vestibular system, just reminding us structurally of what's going on. We have the external ear that you can see to orient yourself leading into that middle ear cavity and finally that inner ear space. That inner ear space is this really lovely membranous organ that is encapsulated in the really hard temporal bone of the body. Because of that really hard temporal bone, it actually is at a lot of risk for force transmission so that this organ itself can become concussed. But then we also know that that has direct connections to the brainstem through the vestibular cochlear nerve, which starts the process of these central projections to the brainstem, to the spinal cord, and then up through the brain. So first, looking into that peripheral vestibular system, Aaron already did a wonderful job going over this. Just to reiterate, instead of the vestibular organ being a single solitary organ, First of all, we know that it's a paired organ, so you have one on each side that are tonically activated at all times. Silly example, but very effective. Thinking about two motors on a boat, they need to be on at all times in order for the boat to go straight. If you have any deviation in that tonic signaling, you're going to have a sense of disorientation that is created from the peripheral apparatus. Beyond that, the vestibular organ actually has five mini organs. So we know that we have three semicircular canals and two gravity sensing organs known as the otolithic organs or the maculate organs, utricle and saccule. So we um, demonstrate here that we have five opportunities on each side, 10 total, for having some disorientation or asymmetry that can cause difficulty for the vestibular system. As Erin also um, talked about earlier, we know that that 
sends projections to the brainstem, which then sends projections to the cerebellum and vice versa, and then up to our ocular motor nuclei, controlling our eye muscles and eye movement, as well as down to the neck and through the spinal cord for the rest of the body proprioception. And then that's really just the beginning. <laughs> so when it comes to the central pathways of the vestibular system, this is an area that I think is neglected a lot in terms of teaching and basic understanding of the vestibular system. We have somewhat more sophisticated knowledge of the peripheral apparatus, but the central apparatus actually has even more opportunities for dysfunction, if you will. So trying to walk through this a little bit, we know that after that um, uh, entering into the brainstem, the pontomedullary junction, we actually make our way up through the deep brain to the thalamus, and then from the thalamus out to the parietal insular vestibular cortices. You'll notice bilateral involvement. The vestibular system is one of the only nervous system activities that requires bilateral cortical input, and that's really important because we think that this is such a well-preserved basic function of human existence. So the brain has done everything it can to create the safety net to try and make sure that the vestibular system stays as well uh, maintained as possible. But obviously, looking at this, we can also see that with our knowledge of concussion, there are many opportunities for injury based on these very intricate and widespread pathways. So highlighting some of those areas in the central vestibular system that seem to be quite affected in um, concussion, we know that the cerebellum, specifically the vestibulocerebellum, um, has a lot of difficulty post-concussion. The brainstem nuclei, the vestibulospinal pathway, the vestibulocular pathway, and then those higher order thalamocortical pathways. So giving us a little bit more context is what does it mean to have a central vestibular system? This is a really great group out of Germany who has done a lot of functional MRI research into central vestibular pathways to try and give us a better idea clinically of what the symptoms are correlating to the areas of the central nervous system. So just highlighting a few important aspects of this, we look first at the cortex. Interesting things can happen such as a room tilt illusion. Really important for our sports athletes is a spatial memory deficit, so actually having deficits in their visual um, spatial abilities. The thalamus can actually create a gait disorder known as thalamic astasia and actually a sensation of being pushed to one side. Brainstem highlights include skew torsion, so having ocular misalignment, room tilt illusion, migraine, as well as an ocular tilt reaction. And then the cerebellum really creates all these interesting and complex nystagmus patterns, which Erin so lovely picked, uh, pointed out, really can be imperceptible if the patient is an excellent fixator. So when you're examining someone in the wide open light, they may actually have what appears to be normal eye movements, but taking away that fixation, you can actually unveil that there's quite a bit of asymmetry and imbalance when it comes to that cerebellar coordinating effort. So we're gonna to touch on some of the essential vestibular disorders today, including post-traumatic vestibular migraine and post-concussive dizziness as this kind of overarching concept. And then we're also going to look into the peripheral vestibular system, discrete entities, including labyrinthine concussions, superior canal dehiscence, post-traumatic BPPV, and post-traumatic Meniere's disease. So thinking about injuries to the inner ear system, on the more major side, we have a temporal bone fracture. This is a, a really nice illustration from Dr. Rob Jackler of our ENT department and a medical illustrator, Chris Graylap, who indicate how different amounts of force transmitted through the skull can create different temporal bone fractures. So we see obviously a larger amount of force, we can get this transverse fracture and then a smaller amount of force and obviously in um, a less than ideal location can create a longitudinal longitudinal fracture, uh, longitudinal being the ma majority of fractures. The longitudinal, as you can see based on this illustration, is more likely to involve that inner ear pathway just based on the transmission of force um, vector. So another um, sequelae that we can see from these uh, temporal bone fractures is actually fracture to the um, superior part or the roof of the vestibular system. So this is something called superior canal dehiscence. It was actually discovered by the dean of the medical school here, Lloyd Minor. So it's also called Minor syndrome. And essentially, if you can imagine, the white space above the blue superior canal is the brain space. So that's actually the floor of the middle fossa. And in some um, uh, traumatic injuries, that floor has been disrupted. What that does is it creates something that we call a third window phenomenon. So when we think of the inner ear system in general, we know that the middle ear bones help to transmit mechanical force through the oval window and then exit through this round window. Let's see if I can do this. Maybe not. Yeah. 
all right, oval window and then exit through the round window. So we have this in and out system. But when we have this opening here, we create a third window system. So that creates two issues. One, we don't have this in and out system necessarily. So you get a reverberation into the vestibular apparatus, which can create vestibular symptoms with things that are changing intracranial pressure. So valsalva, um, heavy weightlifting, that type of things. It can also create really intense autophony symptoms. So being able to hear your own internal organs move, your eyes move, your footsteps echoing in your head, your voice echoing so loudly in your head. Um, and because of this, we also know that intracranial changes um, can independently cause symptoms as well. So we're changing our intracranial pressure quite frequently. And so this brain laying right on top can cause some direct changes to the vestibular apparatus. Treatment for this is surgery. Labyrinthian concussion is a smaller version of the uh, transmitted force through the um, labyrinth. So this is kind of an overarching term for any disruption we think that occurs in the inner ear system. Now prior to 10 years ago, we used to just make this um, diagnosis empirically. You know, this is someone who had had some type of event, the vestibular system is off, we're not seeing clear central signs, so maybe they had a concussion to the inner ear system. Fortunately, though, we've become much more sophisticated in the last 10 years and actually have a vestibular battery of tests that can help us to actually map individually each one of those five mini organs that we were talking about on each side. And by being able to map those, we can identify down to the mini organ exactly the level of dysfunction. That's really important because it can help with targeting physical therapy and giving us an understanding of where the deficits are um, coming from. So to go into that just a little bit, this is my squiggle slide. Bear with me for a second. So in terms of the squiggle slide, this is just identifying the two main tests that we use. Uh-oh. Two main tests that we use to help map out those inner ear organs. So these three tests you see here are the video head impulse test. So Aaron demonstrated an excellent head impulse test manually. We now have goggles that can actually map the eye movements so that we can understand how well that VOR is maintained with rapid head movements. And these are high acceleration head movements. We're talking 100 to 300 hertz. So it's actually much more physiologically applicable to people who are participating in high dynamic activities such as athletes. This also highlights the evoked potentials that we use. So this OVEMP and CVEMP here. OVEMP stands for ocular vestibular evoked myogenic potential, and CVEMP stands for cervical um, vestibular evoked myogenic potential. Essentially what we're doing is, by happenstance, we found out that adding a vibration force to the middle ear could actually transmit to those gravity sensing organs, the utricle and the saccule. So they have almost like a seismometer action to them with the otoconia embedded into the gelatinous matrix. And so by transmitting this mechanical force, we can actually create um, a preserved reflex that creates muscle potential changes in the inferior oblique muscle, so that's your ocular, and then sternocleidomastoid muscles, which is your cervical. So by doing this, we can reliably make a measurement of the inner ear organ functions. So this leads us to a very common and pretty well understood entity known as post-traumatic benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So this slide I really enjoy because it shows us the two different forms of BPPV, which I think are underappreciated. The one that most people think of is canalithiasis, so canal, lithiasis, so stones within the canal. That's the idea that we've had a derangement or a fragmentation of our otoconia that have become free-flowing. Those free-flowing movements can now cause a sense of vertigo or um, a head movement with any head position change, making those crystals move. Cupulolithiasis, though, is underappreciated, and what it is is it's an adherence, or at least it's believed, an adherence of these otoconia to the gelatinous matrix of the cupula, which actually can create opposite nystagmus patterns in BPPV and prolonged nystagmus patterns. When we think of a typical BPPV event, like Aaron showed, you put the patient down, the uh, nystagmus happens for 15 seconds or so, and then it dissipates. In cupulolithiasis, though, because those otoconia are adhered, you will have a prolongation of the symptoms. Post-traumatic BPPV follows many of the um, rules that normal BPPV does. The only thing is it has a higher likelihood of having multi-canal involvement. We think that that 
um, trauma can actually induce a showering of the otoconia. So beyond uh, the posterior canal, which is the most frequently involved canal in typical BPPV, we see a higher likelihood of horizontal canal. You may also have bilateral involvement, which is not very typical for more normal BPPV. As Erin already pointed out, there are classic nystagmus patterns that go along. Oh, now my sound's on, uh-oh. Okay, so <laughs> classic nystagmus patterns. The patient's head has just been put back as a show, and then we see this burst nystagmus. It's upbeating and torsional, and it has a fatigability to it. It's gonna start to slow down, and then it will completely stop. And that's just something we should all commit to memory because it's such a classic finding and it's something that we can fix right in the office. That's a classic posterior canal finding there. And as Aaron already told us, you treat it with the Epley maneuver. The brilliant thing with the Epley maneuver is that you already are halfway through when you do the Dix-Hall pike. You just have to continue on with a turn to the opposite side and a little twist and then you're up. It's really quite easy. Um, single Epley has up to 90% success rate when you do it twice on the same day, but previous head injuries and prolonged bed rest, if they've been, had a really severe MTBI, then it um, may be more difficult for them to treat this. Another common misconception is that the BPV should be gone entirely once you've done the uh, repositioning maneuver. That does happen, but also patients can have a sense of persistent imbalance, especially in the first 24 hours after uh, the repositioning. This may be for multiple reasons. Potentially there's still otoconia out of place, Potentially, they had a motion sensitivity migraine history that is causing them to have a delayed central compensation for this change in their vestibular apparatus. And potentially, they, had, they just need a longer time for that central compensation for other risks, for other factors. So to Markin's otolithic crisis, we think that there is a sudden showering of the otoconia. It's something that can happen in BPPV, but is more um, known to occur in late stage uh, Meniere's disease. So Meniere's disease can occur in anyone without trauma, but we know that there can also be a post-traumatic Meniere's disease. What happens is symptomatically patients say that they have these violent vertigo attacks. They come out out of the blue, so they're spontaneous. They usually last at least 20 minutes up to 12 hours, 12 hours of frank spinning, have severe nausea and vomiting that go along with them most of the time. And the key here is that they have oral symptoms, A-U-R-A-L, meaning they get a sense of fullness, they get a loud roaring, whooshing, really bothersome tinnitus on one ear. So there's a laterality to it as well. This can be delayed years after trauma. So it's important to ask about prior trauma history in case patients start to have Meniere's-like symptoms. The key differentiating factor because of those oral symptoms is to actually document that they have a hearing loss. So this is an audiogram across the x-axis. We have our um, frequency levels for hearing and then for our um, Y-axis, we have our decibels in terms of volume. Uh, the circles in red is always right. The left is always blue. And we see that they have a preferential low frequency loss on one side, the left side in this case. This is pathognomonic for Meniere's disease. So this patient would have a very different treatment plan than someone who is just having episodic vertigo from BPPV, or it's really close cousin known as the chameleon of recurrent vertigo syndromes, vestibular migraine. So vestibular migraine and Meniere's disease can have lots of overlap. In general, though, vestibular migraine should have other migrainous sequelae that go along with it. So we think of patients with vestibular migraine as either having a prior history of meeting diagnostic criteria for migraine, or they have migrainous features that go along with it. So that's things like photophobia, phonophobia, osmophobia, kinetophobia, or motion sensitivity. They also can have some interesting um, little uh, findings as well that come that can come commonly with their symptoms. So things like visual vertigo, that's what Aaron had talked about earlier, where complex visual environments are really bothersome to them. Um, Mounds of debarkment syndrome is the sensation that once patients have um, gotten off of a prolonged exposure to passive motion, that they will still feel like they're on the boat. And then there is this uh, sense of um, head motion intolerance and motion sensitivity, which we see so commonly in post-concussion. Vestibular migraine is notorious for having a normal workup, so patients feel very frustrated. There is no gold standard, instead it's a clinical diagnosis. But because of their impairment and balance that can be associated with it, they can sometimes be labeled as functional, unfortunately, because there is what is interpreted as an exaggerated sway to their balance <laughs> difficulty, and in reality, we think that's all migraine-mediated.
Treatment will go into a little bit more detail with the next talk, but it's essentially mirroring much of the typical migraine management with the addition of vestibular therapy, which really helps with that habituation and desensitization. So I think we're uh, getting close to time, but I just wanted to highlight post-concussive dizziness because I think that this is a fuzzy topic. Um, hopefully you have seen that there are many etiologies from peripheral as well as central standpoint that can have an additive effect when it comes to post-concussive dizziness. So when we think of post-concussive dizziness, we typically think of rocking, swaying sensation. These patients have a really hard time describing what's going on. Uh, but in actuality, if you kind of pick apart all of their many symptoms that they have, you may be able to find these discrete etiologies that we've talked about. And we think that that, become, that comes from a multitude of etiologies. So post-traumatic migraineous vertigo, labyrinthine concussion, cervicogenic vertigo, which is a whole talk in and of itself. Anxiety is such a common finding in these patients. And then finally, autonomic dysfunction, which I think is something that is highly overlooked in uh, many concussion patients. Um, so just to go over my workup when it comes to post-concussive dizziness, I always recommend a complete vestibular evaluation, so getting those V-hits and VEMPs, posturography in some cases. I do an autonomic evaluation or a tilt table test to get an idea if they have a postural tachycardia or orthostatic hypotension. Um, I, all, I will do a mood screen on everyone to get an idea of anxiety and depression management. And then I'll also use physical and occupational therapy as a diagnostic evaluation as well. Physical therapists and occupational therapists are so much better at giving us objective data to go behind the symptoms symptoms that patients are experiencing. And then treatment, as you'd expect, is multifaceted, looking at medications for migraine prevention, mood management, targeted therapies based on our findings on our investigations, cervical physical therapy, and then autonomic support, which is something that um, is undervalued. So conclusions. We know concussion can affect the breadth of the neuraxis, especially in terms of the peripheral and vestibular and central vestibular systems. We know that a um, multiple diagnoses can be involved. Vestibular testing um, can be very helpful. And don't forget to Dix Hallpike everyone and look for migraine. Okay, thank you.